By the way, I use Arch Linux on Windows 10. That's right, Arch Linux is now available on the Windows subsystem for Linux. Also, eight ways to contribute to the Linux community without needing to know a single line of code. That's right, you can contribute to Linux and other free and open source projects without needing to be a programmer. We're going to discuss that today. Zombie Load is yet another Intel processor side channel attack, very similar to Meltdown Inspector, poses a security threat for your Linux systems. Also, schools in the Indian state of Kerala are expected to save $428 million by by switching to Linux. Microsoft open sources the algorithm that gives the Bing search engine some of its smarts. These are five stories that I will be taking into account. And the first story on the docket tonight is the news that Arch Linux is now available on the Windows subsystem for Linux. So that's right, you can use Arch Linux on Windows 10. So this story there's a million articles about Arch Linux coming to the Windows subsystem for Linux, but I wanted to use this article today. It's very short and to the point, but I'm, I'm going to take issues with the author here, Brian Fagioli, and some of what he wrote here, which is why I picked this particular article from Beta News. And as always, I'm going to link to all the articles I discuss on the show today in the show description. By the way, I use Arch Linux on Windows 10. Uh, I'm going to briefly read the first paragraph here that he writes, and you will be able to tell why I'm going to take some offense, basically, to what he writes. Quote, Ah, Arch Linux, the distribution with the most pretentious user base. If you aren't familiar with Arch, please know it is a very good operating system that is unnecessarily difficult to set up. As a result, the ones who are successful and end up using the distro are often quite full of themselves. <laughs> All right, so Brian Fagioli here, I guess, is not a fan of Arch, or at least he doesn't really like, uh, I guess, the Arch install process. I'm not sure why he says the Arch install process is unne unnecessarily difficult to set up. It's a command line install. It's a very quick command line install. You can be done in 20 minutes if you kind of follow the directions in the wiki. The wiki is a one-page install. I mean, it's one page. You only have to scroll down, I think, one time in your web browser. Very short installation instructions. It's not any more difficult to set up than most other minimal command line installs or server installs. If you've ever inst installed a server Linux distribution, you know, Ubuntu server or a Debian or a CentOS server or what have you. Now, I will give Brian a, a little leeway here. He mentions that the Arch user base is kind of pretentious. Yeah, there are some uh, jackasses <laughs> that use Arch Linux. I, I, I won't pretend there aren't, but I don't think that's the majority of people that use Arch Linux. I just think there's a few people that act badly, and they're usually the most vocal ones, like on the Arch forums and whatnot. Uh, he mentions, yeah, just because you were successful in installing Arch, you, you feel full of yourself. <laughs> the Arch install is not hard. I don't think most people, you know, think there's some special snowflake because they were able to install Arch where maybe other people fail. The Arch install is not complicated. A Gentoo install is a little more complicated. Obviously, Linux from scratch is much more involved. But anyway, back to the story. By the way, I use Arch Linux on Windows 10, getting away from the Arch Linux meme, the by the way meme, which I kind of like that he threw that in the, the article. It's a little bit of clickbait, but I'm not afraid to use a little clickbait every now and then myself. So this version of Arch Linux that is available in the Windows subsystem for Linux, this is not an officially sanctioned thing by the Arch Linux development team. Instead, a developer called Scott XU uploaded this to the Microsoft Store, so it's available in the Microsoft Windows Store. In other words, it's not actually clear if the Arch developers are, are, are cool with this. I don't know if the Arch developers may take issue with this. They could eventually, I guess, request Microsoft remove it from the store. Maybe there's copyright issues. I don't know. But for, for now, anyway, Arch Linux is available on the Windows subsystem for Linux. As long as you are on the Windows 10 Creators update or a newer version, you can download and install the Windows subsystem for Linux version of Arch. And he gives a link here, Brian does, in the article. He mentions, though, you may want to act fast and get it ASAP just in case Arch Linux does disappear from the Microsoft Store. And the second story on the docket tonight, eight ways to contribute to the Linux community without knowing a single line of code. 
So this story comes from Jason Evangelo over at Forbes.com. You guys know Jason Evangelo has been doing some great coverage of Linux over at the Forbes website. Uh, I often cover some of Jason's articles on the Taking Into Account series. So, quote, have you ever felt the urge to give back to the Linux community to help out the developers who spend a significant amount of their typically unpaid free time creating the distro software desktop environment that you enjoy on a daily basis? So many of you guys, you want to give back to the projects you use on a daily basis. You feel like you owe the developers of that software something and you, you probably do. But how do you give back? How do you give back? Well, most people think, well, obvious, the obvious thing to do is to contribute code, is to help them with their project, you know, with the programming. But most of us that use desktop Linux are not programmers. What do we do then? How do we give back to the projects that we use, that we know, that we love? Number one that Jason mentions here is marketing and advocacy. So Linux marketing sucks. We know that. There is no real marketing done to promote Linux on the desktop. There never has, there probably never will be because desktop Linux distributions are pretty much all community projects. There are no large corporations really behind any desktop Linux distributions with the exception of Ubuntu, Red Hat, SUSE. But those companies aren't that focused on their desktop operating systems because they're they make all their money through server and enterprise so nobody is really advertising linux on the desktop nobody's trying to market it nobody's out there really pushing it trying to change hearts and minds trying to win over people from windows and mac at least again no big money no 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 corporations that is why the community is this, this is the role we need to take upon ourselves here. We're the ones that need to get out there and promote desktop Linux. We're the ones that need to uh, advocate for desktop Linux. So how do you do that? Well, just tell people about Linux. If you're posting on social media, you guys that still hang out on things like Facebook and Twitter, you know, uh, mention, you know, your, about your workflow, things you get done on Linux, things you like about Linux, the programs you use on a daily basis that are free and open source programs, screenshots of your desktop. You know, people will be interested, especially if they're you know, kind of nice screenshots if you kind of riced your desktop you know, those of you that hang out on unix porn you know share that with the world people will be interested windows users especially will wonder what is that that looks really cool how do i get that and this leads into number three filing bug reports bug reports are very important so you're using your favorite piece of software and it crashes or it does something unexpected something that's clearly a bug not a feature you, you should file that. You should go to whatever site that that particular project uses for reporting bugs, whether it be on GitHub or Bugzilla or what have you, and report the bug. When you report a bug, though, you need to do it properly. Each project has, I guess, its own criteria how you actually need to file a bug report. Usually they want some information, information about your system. You know, what were you doing when the bug happened? If there's any uh, system log, error log information, post that. Um, if you have no idea exactly how you're supposed to report a bug, that's fine to go to, again, GitHub or wherever you're posting this bug and just let them know, hey, I, I think I've, I found this bug in your software. Not exactly sure how I need to report it. What do you need from me? Trust me, the developers will tell you exactly what they, they want from you. That way, they have all the information they need so they can go back, hopefully, and replicate the bug for themselves. That way they can see it in action and then hopefully fix the problem. Number four, documentation. Documentation used to be, it seemed like documentation was the number one way people recommended you to contribute to a project if you weren't a programmer. If you didn't know any coding, the next thing somebody says is, well, just contribute documentation. Documentation is a great way to contribute, but unless you're an expert with that distro or that program, that piece of software you're using, you may or may not want to just jump into documentation because, I mean, documentation, good documentation expects detailed uh, instructions for exactly how to do 
everything <laughs> or whatever whatever it is the topic you're covering so you do actually need to have some experience with what you're talking about if you're going to do documentation but documentation is a good way to contribute if you have the skills and you're not a programmer number five community questions and support now this is just supporting the project through uh, forums irc channels you know giving support to new users you know like on a linux distro support channel i can't get xyz ubuntu installed uh <laughs> Help them out, right? Help help them get through that installation. That's all that people sit in the support forums and the IRC channels for. They're just sitting there to help people out. And if it's that that's something that you think you would enjoy and interest you, please do that. Number six, translations. So if you speak two languages or more fluently, trust me, every open source project in the world wants you. <laughs> they need your help to, to help them with translation. So... Translation is a big one. Those of you, again, many people, especially in, not here in the U.S., it's not common for people to speak more than one language <laughs> fluently. But in many parts of the world, many people speak, you know, half a dozen languages rather well. And you guys can really help out with translation. Number seven, get creative. What does this mean? We're talking about artwork, photography. So helping your favorite Linux distro with its wallpapers or its logo design, helping them with web design, uh, taking photographs if you know you have those kinds of skills. And finally, number eight is probably the easiest one to help out uh, an open source project if you don't know programming, and that is simply donations. Give them some money. So give them some money so hopefully that the developers that are working on that project hopefully can at least sustain themselves a little longer or with enough donations maybe hire on more help to help with the programming so that is jason's eight ways to better contribute to the linux community and uh, i think it's a fantastic article article again i'm going to link to all the articles that i discussed today in the show description one thing i do want to mention is one other thing i think is a very important way that you can help contribute to the linux community is just to educate yourself, to become better, to become better at whatever it is you're passionate about with Linux or free and open source software. Really dive deeper into that Linux distro that you love or that desktop environment you love, the programming language you love, those of you that, that are into programming or your favorite video editing software, or audio editing software, what, whatever, GIMP. <laughs> become a GIMP master if you really love GIMP. And then you're better able to contribute because now some of these things that would be difficult like contributing code contributing documentation contributing support now you have the skills to actually do that where really when you're just coming to linux and coming to some of these free and open source projects you're really not going to be able to do much for even the the eight ways jason suggests that you contribute most people that are just brand new, you know, just a few weeks in, you're probably not going to be able to contribute much. But you, you really need to spend time initially bettering yourself, educating yourself, becoming more proficient with this stuff, and then you're able to actually serve the community in a better way. And the third story on the docket tonight is Zombie Load. Zombie Load is another Intel processor side channel attack, similar to Meltdown Spectre. Uh, it poses a security threat for your Linux system. So this article comes from ZDNet, written by Stephen J. Vaughn Nichols. Quote, Zombie Load sounds like a bad horror adult film, but it's actually the latest class of Intel processor security vulnerabilities. <laughs> Yeah, pretty good description there, uh, Stephen J. Vaughn Nichols. Zombie Load. Actually, the first thing I thought of was Zombie Land, uh, one of my favorite movies, Zombie Land. By the way, first rule of Zombie Land: cardio. So, what is Zombie Load? Zombie Load is basically it's used to steal data that's being used inside a CPU. Researchers actually showed the Zombie Load exploit. Uh, basically, it looks over your virtual shoulder and it sees the websites you're visiting in real time. The example that they were able to demonstrate was someone spying on someone else using the Tor browser, which is crazy. You would think the Tor browser would be very secure, running inside a VM, no doubt. And they were still able to get that data. So normally, 
applications, you know, that are running in a VM and containers or what have you, that they can only see their own data. But this zombie load exploit here basically and it enables attackers to be able to spy on data across these containerized boundaries that normally would be in place. Intel apparently has learned a little bit from Meltdown Inspector. This time they were they were given some time to ready themselves for the problem. They released some patches. They released some microcode patches. So these help clear the processor's buffers, thus preventing this data from being read. So those of you that are running Linux servers or what have you, and you have Intel processors, how do you defend yourself from zombie load? Well, your options are the processor needs to be updated, your operating system must be patched, and for the most protection, hyperthreading must be disabled on that machine. So when Meltdown Inspector first showed up, the Linux dev developers were kind of left in the dark. Everybody was just scrambling, running around with their heads cut off, <laughs> basically trying to figure out how to patch this thing how to patch it this time though it, everyone was kind of kept in the loop until let everybody know they let the, the Linux guy the kernel guys know about this so everyone was in on this from the beginning no one was kind of uh, blindsided by this so how bad is it what is the severity impact of this zombie load exploit where most Linux organizations are calling this a moderate uh, issue as far as severity. Red Hat labels it a little bit higher than that. They call this quote important. Greg Crow Hartman, one of the main uh, maintainers of the Linux kernel, is quoted here as saying quote, all users of Intel processors made since 2011 must upgrade. So pretty much any Intel processor made since 2011 is affected by zombie load. Crow Hartman goes on to say, quote, as I said just before, over a year ago, Intel once again owes a bunch of people a lot of drinks for fixing their hardware bugs in our software. Basically, the kernel devs here, Crow Hartman, but all the, the main kernel devs have been criticizing Intel really ever since Spectre and Meltdown. And once again, they don't like having to fix hardware bugs. This The problem, the bugs here are Intel's hardware is not secure. And the Linux kernel team is tasked with fixing hardware bugs in software, the Linux kernel, and they don't appreciate that. I don't blame them. Red Hat has released a, a statement saying that RHEL 5 and all versions past it, including the recently released RHEL 8, are affected. But again, zombie load is not a Red Hat problem. Every Linux distribution is vulnerable to this zombie load exploit if it's running a Intel processor. So uh, this exploit involves Linux based containers and VMs. So to protect yourself, you also need to patch the following Linux files. You need to patch your kernel, of course. Uh, if you're using a real time kernel, you need to patch that. You need to patch libvirt. Uh, if you QEMU, Q, Q -E -M -U, you need to patch all of that stuff. Anything dealing with uh, VMs, hypervisors, containers, patch it all. Canonical takes things a step further. They recommend everybody to disable hyperthreading if your system is used to execute untrusted or potentially malicious code. Uh, if your system is used to do that, then I think you've got some other problems. Or systems that run programs from which come from questionable sources. You probably shouldn't be doing that anyway. Or systems that host virtual machines from vary varying security domains and or that the system does not fully trust. And the fourth story on the docket tonight is the Indian state of Kerala saves over $428 million by switching its computers to Linux. So this story comes from It's False. So the southern Indian state of Kerala is known for its beautiful backwaters, and but it's also known for something else, its education policy. Apparently Kerala is the first 100% literate Indian state, and it's made IT classes mandatory in its schools since 2003. So this has been going on for some time, and around 2005, they started adopting free and open source software really wherever they could. And it's kind of been their long-term plan, basically to get rid of proprietary software from their educational system and move to free and open source solutions. The plan has been successful as a result, uh, the state of Kerala has claimed to save around $50 million per year in licensing costs 
really in 2015. Now here in 2019, they're expanding their open source mission even further. They plan to switch over 200,000 school computers which will save them around $428 million in the process. Uh, also, they are training teachers. They're going to train over 150,000 primary education teachers. They will be trained to use educational software that runs on Linux, and they will be trained on basically how, how to use this software and how to teach it to children. So 200,000 computers switching from proprietary software to Linux and free and open source software. What does this equate to per computer? Well, each computer, had they went with the standard proprietary solutions that, that you typically would, each computer would have cost over $2,200 in licensing fees had they gone the proprietary route. Instead, they're going, of course, with free and open source software. Uh, they basically have created their own Linux distribution that they're calling IT at School. IT at School GNU slash Linux. It will be based on Ubuntu 18.04, the LTS version. This custom distribution is going to have several free and open source applications customized for the state school curriculum. So this is just another story of some large educational system or government agency or, or what have you, you know, switching away from proprietary operating systems to Linux, switching away from proprietary software over to free and open source solutions. We, we see this all the time. It's not just Kerala in India. Uh, uh, because they've been successful, some of their neighboring Indian states are also taking a look at switching to free and open source solutions. But you see this worldwide. You see this in other countries. We've seen it recently recently with the school systems in Pennsylvania here in the US we also had s s stories about schools in Spain also switching to Linux so uh, the article here ends is with quote have your schools or institutions opted for Linux or open source software over their proprietary alternatives how was the response and experience with it that's a great question you guys that are parts of of large corporations, institutions, or you're part of an educational system, and basically you guys are forced to run things like Microsoft Windows and proprietary programs like Microsoft Office or what have you, the Adobe Suite. Have you ever actually tried to get your institutions over to free and open source software? And if you have, I would love to know what the response to some of that is. Uh, it seems to be we're gaining ground, right? There is certainly a movement. I mean, it's always been a movement. The free and open source software movements have been going strong for a couple of decades, but now we're really gaining steam. And I wonder if more and more corporate leaders are now willing to actually contemplate maybe making the switch. I don't know. And the fifth and final story on the docket tonight. Microsoft is open sourcing their algorithm that gives Bing some of its smart properties. So Microsoft has been fulfilling its promise that they're going to be becoming more and more open source. They heart Linux. They heart Git. They heart open source. You know, Microsoft has really been touting that they're all in on open source. And this is, once again, just another bit of evidence that suggests that they are, are actually serious about this. So the Bing search engine, when you ask the Bing search engine a question such as how tall what how tall is the tower in Paris, you know, the Eiffel Tower, and it knows exactly what you're talking about. It knows that the tower you're talking about is the Eiffel Tower, and of course it's going to spit out an answer. It's going to give you the height. How does it do that? Well, of course, there's an algorithm that controls that, and Microsoft's about to put it out there in, in the public space. They're about to open source. Uh, this particular algorithm, if they're going to license it under a free license, I think they're going to license it under the MIT license, which is the license that they typically release things. Some of their open source stuff. I know they're, uh, yeah, I think VS Code. At least when you go to their GitHub page, the code sitting at GitHub is licensed under the MIT license. I don't think any prepackaged binaries of VS Code are, are open source. But most of what they're releasing now is open sourced and usually under the MIT license. I think they released the calculator code also under the MIT license. The MIT license is a very permissive license. It's not. Like the GPL, there's no copy left principle to it. So unfortunately, people can take that code and repackage it, put it, slap a proprietary license on it, and redistribute it, where something like the GPL, of course, prevents people from doing that. 
part of the reason why I like the, the GPL, but I, some people don't like the GPL for that aspect. They see it as a little too restrictive. They want people to be able to take, I guess, their open source code and slap a proprietary license on it, make it closed source. Uh, hey, different strokes for different folks. We'll do a discussion on free licenses at, at some point on the channel. So how is Bing able to answer these questions, especially when they're not all that specific, like how tall is that tower in Paris? We didn't even tell it was the Eiffel Tower. It does this through the use of machine learning. Basically, it kind of figures out that the Eiffel Tower is the tower in question, because when you search for, quote, how tall is the tower in Paris, it will be near pages talking about towers, talking about Paris, talking about how tall things are. Most of those pages are going to involve the Eiffel Tower, so it kind of figures it out, right? The article talks about Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella. He's spoken in the past, or actually on a number of different occasions, on his desire to, quote, democratize AI and make it available to everyone. You know, not just have a centralized, specialized tool for, for all of this stuff. Um, basically, open source, right? It's Satya Nadella. He has really been promoting open source. He talks about open source a lot, and Microsoft, the company, they're open sourcing. More stuff is the Bing algorithm. Is this really an important thing? Probably not. I, I didn't think open sourcing the Windows calculator w wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, these are small contributions to the community, but they do matter, right? It's, it's the optics of it. You see Microsoft actually putting stuff out there, slapping a free license on it, putting it on GitHub, making the code available. That stuff does matter. There's small steps, but Again, I, Microsoft is starting to win me over a little bit, or at least changing my mind. I don't see them in the same light that I saw them a decade ago. And that was the fifth and final story on the docket tonight. This was Taking Into Account, episode 42. I try to release a new episode of Taking Into Account sometime every Thursday, so Taking Into Account, episode 43, hopefully will be released sometime next Thursday. Before I go, as always, I like to read some viewer questions or comments. Most of the time, I, I typically get them from over on Mastodon. So recently, I made a video about software bloat, about modern software. Most modern software is just bloated, and especially I railed against the modern web. The modern web, I, I, I called the modern web a dumpster fire. I called modern web browsers extremely bloated. They do much more than they should. Web browsers basically should just display some HTML and that's about it. And some people took offense to a lot of things I said actually in that bloat video. But uh, some people you know, really took offense to some of what I said about the web. I guess there's a lot of web developers out there of course. And you know, I, I mentioned I, I hate things like Electron and whatnot. Anyway, one of my followers over on Mastodon, a group of atoms. <laughs> I hope you don't mind me sharing your name here, but you posted it publicly on Mastodon. This wasn't a private message. He, his response to me is, yes, Electron is evil, but I disagree with calling modern browsers bloated. It is just that the web became the universal application. It needs to be a platform that can run a full office suite, multimedia platform, modern 3D game engines, etc. You could be running Lynx or Dillo. I guess, you know, Lynx is a terminal web browser. I do use it sometimes, but very few users would choose to give up the rich modern web. Yeah, you know, he, he actually makes some good points here. So he's right. The web it has become this universal application. It's no longer about just reading web pages, right? It's no longer about displaying some text or even watching a video. Now it's this complete multimedia platform. People are streaming games over the web. You, you have you're doing your full office suite over the web with things like Google Docs and Office 365. You know, these web browsers have to do much more than just display some HTML and some CSS, maybe handle some JavaScript every now and then. You know, these web browsers are called on to do more and more, and that's why they're so heavily bloated. That's why when you open up Firefox or Chrome, you push over a gig of RAM with one tab open, doing nothing. <laughs> And don't don't even get into once you have 10 or 12 tabs open. So this is part of the reason why the web is, is such a mess. He's right. And he he's right. Yes, I could use something like links. And I often do use links if I'm viewing plain text, you know, for websites. If I'm just reading a blog or a wiki or something. Yeah, links is great. But he mentions most users would not choose something like that. Most users would never give up the rich modern web. Most users want all that rich context, the multimedia experience, all the images and the video and the ads and the whiz bang. <laughs> I, I get that, but 
it, there, it, there comes a point of diminishing returns. What are you getting from all this rich content from the web, this rich modern web? What, what, what is it doing better that the web wasn't doing 30 years ago? Uh, do you really have to do your full office suite in the browser? What, what, what's wrong with a desktop office suite? What was wrong with Microsoft Word on the desktop or LibreOffice on the desktop? I, I don't need to do that sort of work in a web browser. That is not the right tool for that job. You know, he mentions, you know, gaming. Obviously, a lot of games are online, but do those games need to be played in the browser? Can can games not have a standalone desktop client anymore? Or even a client like Steam, which is designed basically just for distributing and streaming games. I don't need to do gaming inside Firefox or Chrome. I, it's again, it's not the right tool for the right job. I, again, I, I think this post he, he he wrote over on Mastodon, he he makes some great points, and I, I actually agree with much of what he says. I just I don't know. Maybe I'm a bit of a luddite. Maybe I'm a little old school. I I just hate to see what the modern web has become. Before I go. This show was made possible by Ansem, Chris, the other Chris, Douglas, Dylan, Jack, Leor, Philip, Rob, Robert, and Tony. They are the producers of the show, my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without those guys, taking into account episode 42 would not have been possible. Show is also brought to you by that ever-growing list of names you see on the screen there that help support my work over on Patreon. Without those guys, again, this show would not be possible. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider doing so. You'll find me at DistroTube over on Patreon. All right, guys. Peace.